next part that we're going to go over is um, the Pythagorean theorem. So this will be the material that's in the Pythagorean markdown document if you want to um, follow along with the examples. So uh, this particular section, um, again, we'll kind of see it's a theme that a lot of the sports problems are interested in sort of setting expectations about, about performance outcomes. And in particular, we're often interested in knowing about future wins and which teams are most likely to win. There is one particular way of, of specifying long-term win expectations in sport that's become known as the Pythagorean expectation. And the origins of this are actually in Major League Baseball, um, so one of the popular American team sports. Um, and it was first introduced by, by Bill James. And Bill James is kind of one of the founders of sports statistics, um, and in particular, this field of baseball statistics, which is often referred to as the Saber metrics. Um, so James was writing um, long before anybody was doing sports blogging. He was writing this baseball abstract. And in um, a 1981 version, he introduced this idea of the Pythagorean expectation. Um, so it sort of links with the association of the lengths of the sides of a triangle. Um, and I'll show you where that comes from if we look in a bit more detail of exactly what's the, the form of this um, Pythagorean idea. So um, let's consider a, a competition where each team or competitor earns points towards the win outcome. And we can say um, the points won by the team we'll call PW, and the points lost, so the points earned by their opposing team, PL. A general form of the Pythagorean expectation can be written as you see here. So it's effectively the ratio of those points won. So the share of the points won by the team of interest raised by this exponent alpha. Now the original expectation that Bill James introduced, it gave a coefficient of two. And it's because of that squared value that it was, became known as the Pythagorean expectation, because it kind of looked like the formula relating the sides of a triangle to the um, length or of the hypotenuse. But this is a general form to specify the win expectations um, for the team of interest. So just as an illustration, you can actually find this Pythagorean expectation reported for baseball teams um, on some sites like Baseball Reference. So this is just an example from one season looking at the 2012 season. So we have teams, you see their wins, losses, and then the win expectation implied by those wins and losses. So essentially what this Pythagorean expectation would say um, is that it's reflecting what that team would be expected to do going forward. So it's kind of setting an average, a long-term average, from what they would be expected to do um, for their games going forward. And in baseball, the points here are just runs earned. So in baseball, the team that earns the most runs is the team that wins. So it, it always has to be that way. There's no penalties or draws or things like that in baseball. Um, and it's that run information that becomes the plug-in values into this, this formula. So the way that this would work, if I wanted to calculate the team's expectation under this Pythagorean model, I would take all of the runs they've earned across all of the games played for the period of interest and all of the runs earned by their opponents, and I would take the sum. So it's, it's looking across multiple games when I'm taking this expectation. So that's why 
it's setting more of a long-term expectation, and it's not predicting what we expect in any single match outcome. So the idea would be, this would be something that you would use, let's say it's mid-season, and you want to know where your team's likely to end up by the end of the season. This would be a way that you could try to set an expectation like that. Um, so if that application is reasonable for your particular um, setting, then it all comes down to finding what is that coefficient that's most appropriate for my, my sport of interest. Um, so it turns out that this idea has been applied and found to work fairly well in multiple sports. So you can find examples um, in other team sports like the NFL, NHL, um, and the NBA. So in this section, we're going to take a particular example of the NBA and see what is the Pythagorean model that might be a reasonable way of describing um, results and win expectations for the different teams in the NBA in a particular season. So to do that, we first need to get some of this data. So we already saw um, in our scraping section that the, this basketball reference site has information about outcomes. So we'll just do a little scraping review and see um, in this case, we'll get to see how we can start applying some functions when we need to scrape from multiple pages. Um, so I've given you a little bit of help with this one in that I've given you um, the URL pattern for finding the NBA game results um, for different months of a particular season. So here we're looking at the 2017 season. And you'll notice that there's a month in this URL. So the way that the data on this site is organized is by, separate by month. And the reason that we look at that particular part is because it not only tells us who won or lost, but it also tells us how many points were earned by each team. And we want to be able to incorporate that information into the Pythagorean model. Um, so let me go to the markdown so that you can um, see the full uh, script more clearly. So what I've done is written a function. After inspecting the site um, with the, this game data, I've written a function that uses the RVEST method. So this data um, is statically generated on the site. So I can use the RVEST scraping approach to get the results in each month, um, including the points won by, by both competitors in each game. Um, so what this function will do is to read in a particular month and then create a, a tidy version of a data set that will have um, a row for each team and the points won by that team and then their opponent points and then also a date so that I can order this um, from the earliest to the latest part of the season. So I just call this function MBA scores. Um, so I'll read that in. Uh, to do all of this, um, I'm going to be using these, these packages. So we have the stringer for some a string manipulation, dplyr for just uh, mutating and transforming the data set, lubridate for uh, the date functions, and then rvest, of course, for doing um, the actual scraping of the static data. OK, so reading those, I've got my URL pattern. And now I need to specify the different months that I'm going to pull from the site. So I've just used, there's um, an object already that exists in base R months that has all of the month names. And now the NBA season doesn't happen in every month of the year. So I'm just going to limit it to the regular season, uh, which are the months that you see here. So that's all this stuff is doing, is to limit it to the regular season. 
Um, and now I'm ready. So I'm going to use just an apply function to go over all of those months. And what's happening in this replace statement is that this, this month is being replaced by the actual month name that I want to pull the scores for. And once I've done that, I can then just put all of those into a single data frame. So this do call our bind statement is just taking the results of each of those months and stacking them um, on top of each other. OK, so let's see if we can get this to run. And um, it may take a little bit of time because it's looking up each, each of these um, URL pages and then applying this MBA scores and then reading the data. Um, so in the end, we'll see a data set like this. So this is the first example where we've actually given you a full example of what a kind of full automation where you're, you're collecting data from multiple pages using the string patterns. Um, and so this is a very common way that you can wrap up a, um, a fairly large um, data collection effort. So this is giving us a full season of, of game results um, for the MBA. And this is exactly the data that we want for looking at this a possible Pythagorean model for these data. OK. Um, so we collected that. The first thing we might do just to see, OK, is this Pythagorean model going to even be reasonable? Well, we can do some exploratory plotting to get an idea about that. Because if it is, then we should be able to compare um, the relationship between points won and lost in these different teams and see if that sort of generally uh, corresponds with our, our sense of which of these teams are the stronger among them. Because a win expectation, in a way, is another way of measuring kind of the strength of a particular team. And it also gives us an idea. Well, first, I need to actually load these functions. So make sure that the ggplot and ggthemes are loaded to run all of these. Oh, and I think we need the ggrepel. OK. Um, OK, and then you should, see, you should see something like this. And let me just bring that up in the, the slides, which might be a bit easier to see. Um, so, so the y-axis and um, the x-axis, these are just the two components that would go into the Pythagorean expectation if we were using all of the data for this season. Um, and their ratio gives us a sense of like which teams are going to be more on top in that win expectation. So for this particular 2017 season, what are some of the things that stand out? from this, this plot. In terms of just overall win, win strength based on points won, which team looks like it would be the strongest? Yes. So you can see Golden State's very high. They're the highest in wins. And they're also almost in the middle of losses. So, so that ratio, that win expectation, is going to be the highest for that particular team. Yeah, I think you could see something like that um, if we set um, the, an equal coordinate, which we can add here. So I could do, this will make our aspect ratio uh, 1 by default, and it might give us a better idea about the relationship between the two. 
So it's a little bit hard to see when we include the labels of the teams. Um, but if you remove that, then you might be able to better see. Um, but there seems to be generally a positive correlation. But then in the central area, there's a bit of noise there. But it does suggest, just based on um, where we see some of these teams ending up, um, it would suggest that there is something um, possibly with this Pythagorean approach to assessing the team value. Um, so I want to say a little bit more to make a connection between this model and some that we might be more familiar with. Um, so if we look back at the basic Pythagorean formula and we do a little bit of re-parameterizing, um, you can find an expression of this, an equivalent expression, based on the log odds. So these are just the log odds here, um, which is like the logistic model. That that is um, proportional to the log of the ratio of the points won and points lost. Um, so this suggests a logistic relation that the Pythagorean model um, is basically specifying a logistic relationship between the win expectations and points won and lost. Um, now you might think, oh, okay, well, I can just do this with logistic regression. Well, not exactly, because like I said, we're looking over multiple games when you're doing this, the sums, what goes into these, the wins and loss. You're doing this over multiple games, so you're actually going to have a continuous measure on the left-hand side. So you'd actually want to use a linear model um, to fit that. But that's, that's fine. Um, we can do that as well. But just keeping in mind that this is something that's um, on sort of an aggregate basis. Um, now, in reality, we've been looking at like the full season. But in practical use, if you were actually going to do this for forecasting, you know, you don't need to calculate at the end of a season, you know, what you've already done. You're usually more interested in what you're likely to do going forward. Um, otherwise, you're just basically describing what you can already observe. So um, to give a better idea of how this might work in practice for more of a forecasting purpose, we can just focus on um, a subset of the regular season and how it would have related to um, the results in a later part of the season. So just um, in this kind of hypothetical example, we'll take out the last month and suppose that we had one month left to go and we wanted to know what each team was most likely to do. And then we can actually compare that with what they did in terms of their final um, season performance. Um, OK, so to do that, I'm going to just call the first part up until the last month of the regular season our training data. And this is what we're going to use to get that coefficient that best describes the results under this Pyth Pythagorean model. Um, OK, so that's going to be um, just all of the games that occurred prior to this this date um, in March. So that specifies our training data. And to prepare the data to go into um, the model to get our um, coefficient estimate, I just need to calculate the, the cumulative sum of one and lost points. So here I'm looking at all of the match results as um, different observations along the course of the season to go into the uh, Pythagorean estimate. And then similarly, I'll look at the cumulative wins, which will be um, our outcome, and just transform that into the logit scale. Uh, so that's all that's happening in this set of steps. And then once we've done that, um, I'm ready to go ahead and fit um, the model that corresponds to this, this formulation here in the last line. 
Okay, so the, the standard Pythagorean, it's equivalent to um, a log odds model without an intercept term. And in that case, the coefficient associated with our points one and loss ratio corresponds exactly to the exponent in the, the generalized Pythagorean form. Um, so because the data, the one, um, the win frequency and the ratio might be unstable when we only have a few matches, I'm just um, only beginning to start to um, incorporate the outcomes into the model after uh, a minimum of 20 games have been played um, for each team. So that's all that's going into the, this fit. OK, so going back to the markdown, I can then actually run those data and, and fit the resulting model. OK, and then we get this is a GLM object, so um, we're probably all familiar with, with fitting. And as I said, the connection that that reparameterized form of the model tells us is that the estimate we see here corresponds to the exponent in the MBA Pythagorean. So um, running that code and looking at the results from that fitted model, what would you conclude about the exponent? What's its value? And how does that compare to the value of 2 that's typically found in baseball? What, what's the value that you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot higher, isn't it? And what might be an, the explanation for that? Yeah, so basketball, it's just a higher scoring game in general. So it's kind of telling us that the increase of one, like each additional point, sort of has less, less value um, in basketball as each additional run would in a typical um, game in baseball. OK. Um, so we fit this model, but how do we know that it's actually good? We could do some diagnostics, you know, and, and look at residuals and things like that. But when we want to actually use a model like this for forecasting, that's not going to be good enough. We're generally going to want to actually test it against future data that that model has never seen to get our best idea of how it might actually function in practice if we were going to use this to set expectations for season outcomes for the team. Um, so that type of process of using test or external data um, for evaluating performance is, is validation. And in forecasting, validation is always a, a critical part of what, what we would do. OK. Um, so to do this, we would first get our predictions from our model. And um, doing that is essentially um, redoing the steps that we did to create our training data. And now that we have the coefficient from the fitted model, we can get our a Pythagorean expectation for um, the percentage of wins for each team. And here we're using the results up until the last month to set our expectations for what we think each team is likely where they'll be at at the end of the season. So the main step um, here is the main difference from what we had already put together to fit the model is just this step here of forming this predicted value. So I'm just raising the points one in the numerator by the, the exponent value that we found, so that value around 14. Um, and then in the denominator, doing that with each of the total points one and lost. And notice here that 
rather than the cumulative form, I'm just doing this with all of the, the points for each team. So the ending, um, in the end, what you'll find is a data set that has a single, a single row for each team, and then their, their predicted win expectations under the predicted. OK, so that's our, our expectation. And we want to compare that with what the teams actually did by the end of the season. So for that, I'm going to take all of the data, so the full season, and I'm going to call the summary of the actual wins um, this actual win data frame. And so here my target is this actual variable. So that contains the proportion of wins that the team actually earned. And then I just merge the two together so that I can do some comparisons more directly um, against them. OK. Um, so go ahead and try those steps. And then do a scatter plot of the predicted against the actual and, and interpret what it suggests about the reasonableness of, of this model for setting those season end expectations. So the scatter plot is really a way of visualizing the agreement between the predictions and the actual win expectations. And what we would like to see is a strong positive relationship between the two. So the plot that I put together ends up looking like this. And here I've both of the results on an, on an equal scale. Now, if they were perfectly correlated, we would expect the, the points to fall along a line that passes through the intercept and has a slope of 1. And we see that that, that generally is the case, that um, there seems to be pretty good agreement um, in this case. So at least when we're looking at just one month out, we do a pretty good job. You might also be interested in what if we only, what if we did this at mid-season? Um, and you could easily, you know, test um, the performance there as well. Um, and in a model like this, if it works well, one of the things that you can do not only with assessing where teams are likely to be, but you can look at things like where maybe teams, there may be some teams that deviate from these expectations in ways that suggest that they're maybe overperforming the Pythagorean model or underperforming. And those things can be valuable um, to know when assessing those teams as well. Um, so, so that's a basic example of this, this notion of the Pythagorean expectation. Um, so you can see how you could apply it to other sports. Um, it's been primarily used with team sports, but um, it is possible that you could extend it to individual sports. Um, I've looked at applying it in tennis, for example, and it turns out that um, not only can you find a version that describes outcomes in, in tennis well, but it, it actually um, shows an expectation um, that's quite similar in form, so a coefficient that's nearly the same as what you find in baseball, which is kind of interesting since they're two totally different sports. Um, and I've just provided some references on this, um, or that particular study, and then other work on this Pythagorean um, form. So you can read up on that if, if that is of interest. Were there any, any questions on this model? Yes? <laughs> 
Yeah, that was one of the things that I, I thought, I'm not sure that this model will actually hold in tennis because a tennis player, because of the hierarchical nature of tennis, where you have points within games and games within sets, um, a player doesn't have to win every point to win the match, unlike um, baseball or basketball. Um, so it wasn't clear what is the right point value. And I suppose that could happen in, in other applications as well, where you might think that um, there might be some question about what measure do you actually use in the points in this Pythagorean. Um, it turned out that the measure among kind of basic summary stats in tennis um, that are available, the one that was, had the strongest association with the win expectations was breakpoints one, um, or effectively like, you know, broken games, I guess, of, of service. Um, and, and that was the one that showed this same coefficient as what you see in baseball. So it was nearly um, an exponent of two. And there's been some work that suggests there's a relationship between um, that result and um, a model that assumed a Weibull distribution for those points, for each of those points. So you can kind of construct that result if you assume that those are both like independent Weibull distributions. So there's kind of an interesting mathematical relationship that underlies, underlies them. And it's, it's just, it's quite surprising like how applicable this is. But again, it, it's, its use is somewhat limited because often we're interested in predicting for individual games. And it's not clear exactly how you would take this information and do that. You could imagine maybe this long-term win expectation could maybe be um, like a covariate in a model to predict individual game outcomes. But that's usually what we're more interested in. But it has, it's kind of an a, me a method of historical interest, and it could be something where maybe it could be a predictor that you would put into a model for different types of um, forecasting. Um, okay, so um, the next model I wanted to share is uh, the GAM. So we'll have a look at the generalized additive models, so that'll be the GAM markdown. Okay, so um, a lot of the examples that we've looked at already are focusing primarily on um, what I would call sort of box score type of sports data. Um, this is the most readily available data, which is great because it means usually you can have very long periods of history for a particular sport. But the data itself is somewhat limited. It's generally just like a score outcome, an aggregate result for the match. So it doesn't have a very rich description of what actually happened in that particular game. Um, nowadays, there's more and more um, data that actually tracks what's happening within a game. And this could include movement of the ball or movement of the players. Um, and this is, um, can be gathered for different types of, of systems. So you can use camera-based tracking systems to get that positional data. Sometimes players, like players in Aussie rules football, will wear GPS throughout a match. And that will give you positional information and other types of um, sort of performance measures as well. Um, so this rich data um, is some of the most exciting things that we have in, in sport research. Unfortunately, it's not as readily available in general. So a lot of times it's being collected, but it may be proprietary um, for that sport. And you might have to make a particular data agreement with the data provider in order to get access to that, which is a shame. Um, fortunately, some of that data is, is out there, so at least we can get some experience with this kind of tracking information and the sorts of models that can be used with this kind of rich um, positional data. And one example of that is the pitch FX 
um, which is tracking data about pitches in, in Major League Baseball, so another baseball example. Um, and even better for our users is that there is a package that makes it very easy to access these data. So um, the author of this package, PitchRx, um, is Carson Siebert. Carson's also written um, the Plotly package, if you've ever used that to create sort of interactive web um, plots. Um, so, so Carson also is a sports fan, and he has created this nice package that also has some cool visualization tools, but um, most importantly, it gives us an easy way to get to a very unique kind of sports data. Um, so if you've already have, it, have the PitchRx installed and you load that data, the first thing that you're going to want to do is to actually read some of these, this pitch data in. Um, the function for doing this is called scrape. And the main way that you would specify the date of interest would be by specifying the start and end dates. And what will happen is this will pull the um, pitch FX game data for all games and pitches that happened within that time period. Now you'll notice in the example that I have here, I've actually only extracted for one day. And that's because it, the data actually is quite rich. I mean, there are a lot of games that happen in Major League Baseball. Like every team plays like 182 games in a season. So you should be cautious <laughs> when running this because if you specify like a very long period, um, it could take quite a, a, a while and you'll get a very large data set back, which is cool, but it, you, know, you might need to be prepared for, for that kind of data. But just to see, get a sense of how, how it works, um, I'll go ahead and load and read in um, this particular period of games. And I'm just going to assign the results of that to this object called pitches. And when doing this, um, just keep in mind that there is an expectation that the data will be in this particular year, month, and date formula. Um, and as the scrape is running, you'll see results of all of the different uh, files that were read in, which will give you a sense of the number of, of games that were included. OK, so let's look at exactly what's contained in this object. OK, so the result of this great function, it's going to have an array of data frames. Um, and the data frame that we'll most be interested in is the one named pitch. And there's um, a full glossary or dictionary describing the results of the great function. Um, in complete detail that you can find at this, at this site here. And we can just go see if we can open up that dictionary. OK, so you can see um, the descriptions of the different components. So for example, the pitch element would have information about the speed um, the locations at the start and end, the velocities at the start and end of every pitch that happened in the games for the period that was um, extracted. Um, this data is um, three-dimensional in nature because we have information in the x, y, and, and z coordinates. Um, so we do generally need some particular um, specialized tools for trying to explore what this data might be showing. And the package has three particular ones for that. So there's an animate, um, an interactive, and a strike um, type of charting tools. To give you an example of how you would start using these, um, I'm looking, I'm going to prepare the data set so that we can use the strike um, illustration. 
And um, to do this, you'll have to construct a data set from multiple elements of the results from your, your scrape command. Um, specifically, you'll need to take from the pitches, um, the pitch information, and the at bat. And to do that, you're going to combine the unique identifier that you'll combine with will be called the game day link, which effectively is like the URL for that particular game. And then a number, which should correspond to which at bat number or pitch number it was. So I'm just combining those two um, to create this decisions data frame. And that's going to be all the information that I'll need in order to use the strike zone function. Um, the main reason that we need to combine the two is that the at bat function will want to know about which side the batter is standing on, uh, which is in this, this stand information. The variables that I'm pulling from the pitch have to do with the position um, as that pitch crosses the home plate um, in the x and z coordinate. And then this des variable is the designation of what pitch type it was. And we'll look at each of these um, in more detail. Um, OK, so on your own, you've got the, if you've read in the pitches, then you can go ahead and look at this des variable and what are the different designations that these pitches can have by a command like a table command, for example. So go ahead and give that a try and see what descriptions you see. Now we're, we're gearing up to use the strike visualization. So we're most interested in strikes. And based on the codes, descriptions that you see in this designation variable, what do you think would be the category for strikes without a swing? Cold strike. Yeah, exactly. But you'll see there are a few different strike types in there. So the, the designation variable um, is, is pretty detailed. But the ones that we would be interested if we wanted to distinguish strikes where the batter did not swing from other strikes, we would focus on the called strike. OK, so let's say that we want to look at the locations uh, at the time of home plate with these called strikes. We might be interested in that because a called strike where a batter didn't swing depending on the nature of the situation, could be an indication of a strike that the batter had trouble reading. So maybe they thought that it was likely to be, to be a ball. Um, and that might be a particular type of pitch that we're interested in. So if we want to look at more detail in the called strikes, we can use the strike FX function in um, the package with our decisions data frame that we've prepared. And then I'm just going to give um, a geom type of a tile, which will be a kind of um, a heat map type of looking chart. And then I'll specify the designation of interest, which will assign sort of a color palette um, in both the y and x directions. So I'm just going to give the designation of called strike. If I run this command, um, I'll see a, a chart like this. And the two, the two boxes that you see are distinguishing between left and right-handed um, batters, I think. So it has to do with the, the, that stand variable designation. Um, so the densities are just giving us a sense of the frequency. OK, so the lighter shades are, are the more frequent. Um, instances of this call strike. And again, the y-axis here, we're looking at the height direction. That's the PZ. Um, 
and then the horizontal will be the px variable. Um, so this is basically kind of mapping intuitively to um, what we would see as that ball was actually coming in over home plate. Um, is there anything that this sort of exploratory chart would suggest about how those variables might be related to a called strike? Is there something about the height or x direction that stands out? Yeah, there may be some, some difference there. But what about like a lot of that light is, seems to come in this lower range. So we don't have a comparison group, but just looking at this alone, it seems like more of the called strikes are happening in the lower region of the strike zone. So these, these boxes are giving us kind of the um, official zone based on which type of, of hitter or lefty or righty that we have. And it looks like more of them are coming in this lower, lower area. Well, I mean, we probably can't generalize too much because we're only looking at like one day of games here. So it's sort of hard to say from this, this alone. Um, and you'll also notice that even though there might be an official designation of where that zone should be, the strike is ultimately the determination of the, the umpire, the home plate umpire. So it might not, you'll notice like there are some some instances right where these are happening outside of those zones and that can just be by the nature of the calls of the the umpire ah uh, ah uh, i see so you, this rectangle you think is more wide than high yeah i'd have to look at that more to really say, it's hard to tell because of their overlapping, but you're right, it doesn't look exactly square, and it, it seems like it, it, may be, it may be wider um, than it is high, but um, in any case, this gives us some, some kind of intuition about maybe some interesting features with the, the called strike. Um, we may want to try to understand that better by actually comparing it with other types of strikes. Um, so suppose that we wanted to evaluate what is actually truly distinguishing or things that might be um, related more to called strikes than other types of strikes. Like I said, we might be interested in this because it could say something about kind of the visual acuity or readability of a pitch from the batter's perspective. Um, so what are some of the things that could result in a called strike? Like I said, the readability, but there could also be something about the pitch count. So sometimes if it's, um, if it's a count in which there's really no risk to the batter to just wait for the pitch that they really like. So if they've got, you know, three balls and no strikes, they might go ahead and just let that pitch go by if it's not one that they like, or they might hope that it's going to be a ball because then they get an automatic base. So the count could also be a factor here. It's not purely the readability, but, um, but it still might give us some information about, about that. So let's suppose that we wanted to try to build a model about the difficulty of reading a pitch using called strikes as that, that sort of measure of, of readability. What are some of the factors that we might consider related to whether a ball is going to be a called strike or um, some other type of strike? So I've kind of made it a little bit easy by <laughs> suggesting some here. 
Uh, so the trajectory, right? Like pretty much any physical aspect of that pitch potentially is going to have a relationship to the kind of strike that it is. Um, so that could include its position, you know, its speed. Um, and then there could be factors about the context, right, the count, as I mentioned, and then maybe also the handedness of both the pitcher and batter. Um, so potentially all of these things could be incorporated into the model with, from the pitch FX data. Um, we'll focus here just on those physical characteristics to just give you a starting idea of kind of how you could construct these, one of these models. Um, so what I've done in this next slide is to just expand that merge so that we have a bit more positional and speed information. So you'll notice the select command, I've just incorporated um, more of the variables from the pitch element. And then from the at bat, this is going to have information about the batter characteristics, so like their height. Um, there's information about, oh geez, information about um, the number of pitches that the pitcher has thrown. So maybe there's like a fatigue element that, that might be a factor in some of these models. Um, okay, so we have this expanded data. And now I'm going to um, limit it to strike types. To do that, I'm going to just look for any, huh, any pattern um, in the designation variable that has strike in the name. That'll isolate to all strikes. And then I'm just going to um, create a binary variable for whether it was a called strike or not, just using the called string. Um, so my outcome of interest here is this variable called that I've created. Um, so in general, when we're interested in how some variables are related to an outcome, um, we our first approach to doing this is generally some kind of regression model. And um, the most popular of them is the generalized linear model, which has this basic form, right? We have um, some function of an expectation that we associate with a linear um, set of coefficients and covariates. Um, but do you think if we're looking at the relationship between the called strike and so the, let's say the probability of a strike being a called strike and some of these variables that we have like position, speeds, do you think a model like this is going to be reasonable? Why might that be? Right, it's going to assume that there's some kind of linear relationship between that probability or maybe, let's say, the, the, load, the log odds and these fairly complex physical measures. So in general, when we're dealing with this, this kind of positional or spatial data, the linear assumption is, is generally going to be questionable because we know that the relationships are going to be um, more complex and generally nonlinear in nature with our outcome of interest. Um, so one extension that can work well in this setting with these types of data is the generalized additive model. And it turns out that if you write down the GAM, it actually has a very close relationship um, syntactically to the GLM. So the form that you see here is the basic form of the GAM. What's the main difference between the GLM with this specification? Can anyone see the difference? It, it happens right in here. Yeah, so now you'll notice instead of this linear sum, where I just have some coefficient multiplied by a covariate. Now I've got a function. It's a sum of some functions, and I haven't even specified what those functions are. Um, so this is the main distinction. So now we're looking at an 
additive set of functions of our covariates when we're using the GAM model. So what are those functions? Well, typically, they're going to be some kind of smoothing function over the covariate. So like in our application, we'll be smoothing over the positional data or the speed data. And that can be done with polynomial functions. Or more often, you'll see that done with, with some kind of splines, which are quite flexible, considered non-parametric versions of representing um, that um, data contained in our covariates. Um, in doing this, now we're going to have additional parameters associated with, with those smoothers. So that's a main distinction. We also lose a bit of interpretability. So one of the, the nice things about the linear model, and probably why it's so popular, is that the, those beta variables, they have a direct interpretation about the association between changes in our covariates and changes in our outcome variable. We're going to lose that when we have some of these complex smoothers that are applied. But we'll have a more accurate description of our outcomes, and we'll then be able to use more plotting, uh, plotting techniques to try to just understand how the covariates are actually associated with the outcome. Um, to implement the GAM, I think the most common model that's available in R, uh, the library of GAM functions, is the MGCV package. And it has three main um, additive, additive modeling functions. There's the, the GAM. Um, there's a BAM. And this one is just kind of has some optimization in it for larger data sets, which if you're working with um, longer periods with the pitch FX data, that will generally be the one that you'll likely um, implement. And if you're interested in evasion implementation, there's also functions for specifying evasion um, additive model. The actual syntax, um, you can see from this example. So here I'm taking the strikes data frame that, that we constructed, and I'm using the BAM function to relate the called strike, um, the likelihood of a called strike out of strikes, to a smooth function of the height. So we saw that from that exploratory plot, it looked like there might be some relationship between um, the height location and whether or not it was a called strike. And then I'm specifying a binomial family, just as I would with the GLM model. So you'll see a lot of commonalities with the GLM. Just like we saw in the, the mathematical formulation, the distinction really comes in how the covariates are specified. So this S function that you see, it's a spline smoothing function. And this K is just setting um, the number of kind of maximal knots that will be used to find um, a just a well-fitting um, version of that smoothing function um, for this particular data set that we have. So the results of that I'm putting into this object fit. With um, diagnosing, so any model that we look at, we want a set of diagnostics to evaluate um, how well it's describing the data that we fit it to. To do that with this package, you'll use the gam.check function. And this will return a set of residual diagnostics as well as information about the fit of your smoothing function. Because like I said, there are tuning parameters there. So you also want to, to evaluate the properties of that smoother. Um, so here's an example of your residuals. These are um, uh, standard like you would see with the GLM. And then here's this additional information, which is something that would be new in this GAM setting, because it's information about the smoothing, the smoothing function. Um, so the K here is basically setting the amount of complexity that you're going to allow that that smoother could take. Um, fortunately, the GAM model itself has built-in penalties to try to avoid um, an overly complex model in your smoothers. Um, so generally, you don't have to worry about um, over smoothing 
there's more of a risk of potentially under smoothing in your K. So if you set that K value too low, that's generally more of a concern because of the, this kind of penalized um, implementation. So in the output, what you would look to try to identify if there's a risk of under smoothing is in this K index. If that value is, is very low, um, then you'll have, that would be some indication of potentially under smooth data. Um, so particularly if you're seeing values that are much lower than one, um, that would tell you that you might want to refit their smoother with an increased K. So that's essentially what you're looking for in that, that output. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's related to, to overfitting in a sense, um, but there are built-in methods. So it's based on a, a, a penalized implementation um, or effectively an optimization of the parameters. So that will help to control against the overfitting. So it's already built to try to favor a more parsimonious smoothing function. So in general, what you're going to inspect is more that you haven't given enough complexity than that you've given too much because of that, that built in, those built-in penalties. Um, OK, so we also have a general summary function. And like I said, you can see um, the estimated values here um, for your intercept, your smoother. but the interpretation is, is limited, right? Because now this is some kind of complex spline, so um, it's, it's less clear, really, how to interpret. You're going to want to actually just get some fitted values um, to evaluate it. Um, before I show some of that, I just want to give some examples of other types of smoothing specifications. So the, there's a lot of things you can do, and you can look at the manual page for this, the S the spline smoothing function to, to see some of those examples. But a few shown here. The first one here, we're adding in um, a term that has both now the x position and the z position. And it will include interactions between the two in the smoothing function. So now we're having sort of a, a more, I guess, multivariate spline based on both of those positional values. Um, and then in this example below, I'm adding in an extra smoother that has information about the velocity in the y and z direction um, at the, and the zero here indicates that it's at the time that the pitch is released. Um, so you might think both position and speed are going to be factors in a called strike versus other strikes, and this would be a way to incorporate that. And essentially what you'll want to do if it's unclear whether it's important to include these, you can use an, a model comparison um, information criterion approach to try to make that determination. So um, as an example, suppose that I fit each of these. I can use an AIC to evaluate which may appear to be the relatively um, better model. So we're looking for the, the lower information criterion um, as an indication of the better fit in this case. So we would find that the model that includes both the position and speed um, results in the lowest AIC among these three, and would suggest that that is a better overall description of the strike outcomes. Now, to actually assess these predictions, you can use a visualization tool in the package called the viz.gam. And the way that it would work is you would just give it the fitted model if you just wanted to evaluate the results um, of your, um, the data that was actually used in, in that model. And if I specify the contour, um, this would be the results of that function. So it gives me uh, effectively a, a contour of the called strike predictions. 
And you can see that the, the different lines correspond to a different um, probability level. And the lighter areas are the higher probability areas. So we see that this range in relation to the um, X and Z positional data at the home plate um, this region appears to be areas of, of high called strike uh, probabilities for this particular sample of data. Um, okay, so <clears throat> there's, a, there's an exercise here where you can expand and alter the view to incorporate different variables, and that gives you some information about um, the properties of the, the speed and positional data suggested by this particular fit. I'll just leave that so that we have time to go into the next section. Um, but um, hopefully this gives you enough to start playing if this is an area of models that are interesting to you. Again, these are most common when using positional or tracking type of data. Um, and that's not as common <laughs> these days in sport, um, but it's becoming more so. And of course, there'd be other examples of other types of application with similar types of complex data where um, a more non-parametric type of regression approach, which the GAN provides, would be um, preferable to a kind of standard linear type of model. All right, so just to wrap up, I wanted to introduce um, some other forecasting approaches. And this one's in the service winner markdown. Um, so if you open that up, what we're going to look at in this section is forecasting and using Bayesian inference. Um, so we've had some examples of sort of models for setting expectations. And in this one, we're going to look at a very kind of specific type of, of outcome, like an individual event. And specifically, we're going to be interested in outcomes on serve in tennis. Um, so in tennis, every point in a match begins with the serve. And the nature of the serve, it being an overhand action, um, one of the you, one of the only shots really other than sort of occasional smashes that you'll see in a rally that have this type of motion, it makes it a very powerful shot and that means that it has extreme advantage to um, the serving player. So you'll see that both in the men and women's game, the player who is serving tends to win the majority of, of the points. Um, so it's very critical to winning and you can see that here. So I've just taken a summary um, at the, it, I think this is looking at the men's game, and you'll see at the top in orange, that's the percentage of points won by the server. So you can see that it's, um, the average is in the high, high 60s. Um, so it's a very important part to the game. Sometimes you'll hear players talk about free points on serve. So this is a quote um, from one of our Australian players, Alex Dimonor, after playing um, one of the current top players, Alexander Zverev, he said, I think it was all about him being able to get free points on his serve. He's a top 10 player, and in these decisive moments, he could get some free points towards the end of the match. So what is this about free points? When players talk about free points on serve, they essentially mean a point that the returner couldn't do anything with, that effectively was decided by the serve and the serve alone. And there are two ways that that can happen. So either an ace, so this is a type of serve that lands in play and the returner does not even get a chance to touch the ball. Um, or service winners. These are situations where the serve lands in and the receiver might touch it with the racket, but they're not able to return it back into play. There's really, it's, it's too good for them to do anything with. So those are both outcomes that um, are effectively considered free points on serve. 
Getting free points is really important from the server's point of view for a number of reasons. Um, it keeps points very short, which can be important for preventing injury. Um, and obviously, a higher free point percentage means that you're very likely to have the advantage in, in winning that match. So there's a good reason why in tennis you'd be interested in understanding how a player is able to get more of these free points and get a higher percentage and who does that the best in the game. Um, to do this, you need fairly detailed point level data. You need to know who was serving, what was the service outcome, and also what type of outcome, right? Because I need to be able to, to distinguish aces and service winners from other types of outcomes on that service point. So it's fairly detailed um, point level data. Um, fortunately, there's much more of this data available these days. And um, I've written this package, Deuce, which I've tried to create a centralized place for a lot of these um, historical tennis data. And that's what we'll take a look at here to start to build a model for um, three-point winning on serve. The data set from Deuce that we're going to look at, it's called the GS point by point, GS for Grand Slams. Those are the four most uh, prestigious tournaments that happen during the tennis season. In this data set, every row corresponds to a single point in a match. And it has information um, about who was serving, the service outcome, and also the rally count, which will be helpful to us in determining whether it was a point that was a free point for the server or not. So in this example, I'm just going to focus on the uh, matches in the 2017, which are the ones that have the most complete information about uh, rally counts. OK, so um, in this exercise, if you've already loaded and installed the, the Deuce package, you can load that and then um, read in the data, the data set GS point by point, just using the data function. And what I'd like you to do is to limit the data set to 2017. We'll look at just men's matches. And we're going to want a model for free point outcomes. So we need to derive this free point variable, as well as the server and receiver variables. And in the end, the information that we'll just focus on for this modeling exercise will be the match ID, server, receiver, the free point, and then which serve number it was. So in tennis, you can have a first or a second serve. Um, and we want to distinguish those two. OK, so um, with this data set, the way that you would do that, um, you could get to that, that data structure with this set of commands. So the filtering step happens here. We restrict to men and to 2017. The, the trickier part of this is the free point variable derivation. So the way that that works is we look for rally counts that are one or less, because sometimes a, a service ace is indicated as a zero. When the server won the point, and when it, did, it didn't involve an unforced error on the part of, of either player. So that's all that this is doing here. And that's, that effectively is our definition of a free point for the server. Uh, once we have that indicator and our other information about who was serving and receiving, um, we just select out those variables to simplify the data set. OK, and now I have just an exercise in here on, on summarizing that data and getting more familiar with it and putting some plots together just to give an idea of what's typical for, um, for those free point variables. But I'm going to move on just to the modeling. Um, so we have some time to go over this in a bit more detail. So the free point outcome, right, it's a binary type of outcome. So we might start most naturally with a binomial model where we suppose that there's some probability of any particular service ending in a free point. Um, and then that 
um, the actual number of free points earned is just that probability's realization over some n number of trials. Um, the main question is, but what determines p? This, the probability that this particular serve could be a free point. What are some of the things that might, might be factors we would want to consider in that probability? Speed, yes, that information sometimes is harder to get, but, but that is available more these days. So speed might be something. What about the serve number could be important because we know that players will tend to take less risk on the second, and that could make it harder to have a free point. There could be something, yeah, about maybe the pressure of the situation. Maybe if a player gets tight because they're facing a break point, they're less likely to get an ace. Could be something about that. We probably also just want general overall ability of that player on serve and their opponent's return ability. Because maybe the same serve hit to, you know, a hundredth player ranked in the world is less likely to be returned than if I'm facing Nadal, for example. So, um, so those could all be some things, and they're more or less maybe easy to, to bring into the data. For this example, we'll just focus on the player ability measures and serve number. So everything that was thrown out were all good ideas, but this, so this will just be a basic version, but not probably the, the best overall description of free points. Um, but just starting with this model, we might suppose um, uh, a, a logistic type of relationship between the probability and um, this alpha i represents the ability of the of serve for the i player, and then this beta j is the ability of the receiver. So here we assume that the more positive that this receiver's ability is, the more negative an impact it has on the chance of a free point for the server. So that's sort of our basic structure. So it's like a standard kind of log linear form. Um, OK, so we need to prepare the data. So we want to look at this in an aggregate basis. There's nothing here that's a covariate that's specific to any particular serve. We just need to know um, the players and then the outcome. So we can aggregate those results. Um, so here I'm just taking the free point data and I'm grouping it by the server. And I'm just going to focus on players that have more than one match because if I include players that only have one match, then it's a little bit hard to distinguish their free point ability from just the particularities of that particular matchup with their opponent. So it might be hard to distinguish between the opponent effects and the, their just average ability on serve. Um, and then I've created um, just a a sample of test and training data so I can do some of the validation that we saw previously um, with these data as well because we'll be interested in seeing how well this does in forecasting free point outcomes. Um, okay, in this section I have to prepare index, the indices for the server and receiving players so I'm going to use the J index for the server and K for the opponent. And that's all that I need then to have my training data set up. So now I just limit it to wherever that test variable that I created is zero. That'll be my training data. Um, so in this example, I'm, I'm going to actually do a Bayesian implementation. The main components, right, we have our player parameters. Um, that are the, just a constant. So what's kind of, this represents just what's the average free point percentage for a, a typical player. 
And then the alpha i's are the server abilities, and the thetas are going to correspond to our uh, receiver abilities. Um, the nice thing about the Bayesian setting here is that it's an easy way to implement this kind of hierarchical structure where we have player-specific effects, and there may be multiple versions of that. So we have both server and receiver hierarchical effects that we want to consider. Um, so the Bayesian setting is particularly natural for dealing with these kind of multi-level models. Um, when doing this, you're going to have to um, set priors for any of the parameters that you see within these the distributions for the player parameters. Um, and in this case, I'm just specifying non-informative priors for each of them. And you can see exactly what those are in the, the model code. So I'm going to open up this page to be able to look at that, um, the full model more in more detail. Um, to implement a Bayesian model, there are a number of ways to do this in R. I think the R-JAGS, which is, um, implements a Gibbs sampling approach for um, models, is particularly good, particularly if you have any like normal-based um, distributions or other standard distributions and in this hierarchical structure. To use R-JAGS, your first step is to specify um, a model in, with a string and um, it will generally have a section that corresponds to the, the lower level. So in our case, that would be kind of the server level results. Um, so you'll see this loop here is specifying the total three points expected out of so many serves and given the probability. And then down here, this is exactly what we had written out, but now just in the R JAGS language. So it's specifying that this probability is actually described by a constant and then a server factor and a um, receiver factor. And all of this stuff below is just specifying the prior distributions for those components. And these are just the way to give sort of non-informative priors to each of those variables. So that encompasses the model. And once we have that, the way that the JAGS model is actually run is to provide that um, string, which has all the model specifications, and then any of the variables that are either that are fixed, so any of the indices or um, sample sizes, so how many um, data points it will do these loops over. Those all have to be provided in order for this to run. Other things that you'll want to specify are like the number of chains that you'll run, um, adaption, and these relate more to the, the um, sampling properties and um, making sure that you can um, converge to the, the posterior. And you can get guidance about these things in standard um, Bayesian, um, Bayesian text. Once um, I run this, I can then update to get um, additional data points from the, post, the converged posterior. Um, and I can evaluate the quality of the convergence with things like the trace plot. Um, and let me show an example. of what that would look like. So here's an example from um, a fit from the 2017 data for this new parameter. And you're essentially looking for um, a lack of, of autocorrelation or any kind of systematic pattern. Um, that would be an indication of, um, of convergence. You can add additional parameters. So I could add in the alpha parameters the theta parameters. But keep in mind, when I do that, it's going to be a whole vector that's equal to the number of servers and receivers, because those all have these, these alpha, alpha j, theta k associated with them. So it's actually a whole vector of parameters. 
in diagnosing convergence, there are also statistics available like the Gelman Rubin convergence statistics, which I think from the CODA package, you could also apply um, to just get a generalized summary if the, the trace interpretation isn't that clear. So once I have these results, I can then summarize things of interest. Um, so in this case, I'm looking at the mu value, which um, I assigned the outputs of the, the mu to this hyperposterior. So this is giving me the values of that constant term, which kind of corresponds to what's like the average free point percentage in these data. Um, and this, fun this function just takes it from the logit scale to the probability scale. And when we do that, we can then look at the posterior distribution. And this suggests that when we fit this just to all of our data, we're seeing about a proportion of 38 are ending in ACEs or service winners. That would be the posterior kind of an average from these data. Um, so that's one thing that's interesting just for the population in general. But of course, with these, we really want to know about what's going on with individual players so we can um, use similar functions to estimate um, summaries for the posterior parameters associated with particular player abilities. So the server abilities were all wrapped up in that alpha parameter. So using that same CODA samples, I can get um, a number of posterior samples for the server abilities and use some, some tidying functions like gather to put that information into a form that I can more easily plot or summarize. Um, so here I do one version for the alpha parameters and then the receiver parameters with the theta, basically the same set of steps, but I'm just replacing the parameter alpha with theta. And then I can combine all of these. So let's say I'm interested in the posterior median as an overall summary of player serviceability um, and receiving ability based on free point outcomes. And this is a plot um, that we can use to summarize. So some of the things we might be interested in would be along the alpha, those higher values would indicate generally what would we see if the, these players up here are better servers? Yeah, the, a higher alpha value, remember this one corresponds to the server's ability in terms of getting more free points. So if free points is an indication of a good server, that means that alpha parameter is telling us um, adjusted for the opponent ability, which is the cool thing that this model is doing. So independent of the opponent, we could say something about the quality of that, of that server. So we see um, John Isner, for example, ends up with the highest alpha parameter, which makes sense if you know um, about the current tennis. He's one of the, the best servers in the game. Um, and then uh, along the theta, like this will generally relate more to, you know, stronger receivers in the sense of maybe being able to do something with these, um, these tougher types of serves. So it's a kind of a very specific subset. It also may give us some indication about whether it's a more aggressive receiver. So somebody that really maybe attacks early on the serve. Um, so th so that, that theta is kind of an interesting one because there's a kind of a style component associated with it as well. Um, and so th there are a few slides about how you could modify that model statement to actually um, apply the model on the test data. So that data that's not actually being used to fit, to find the fit for the alpha and thetas themselves. We can add that in though and then at the same time that that model is estimating those parameters, we're also getting forecasts for what we would expect the test data based on which server and which receiver was playing. And we can use that as a test evaluation. So 
these slides just expand to include that test data. And then what we'd want to do is to basically look at things like the difference between those um, free point outcomes in our test data and what really occurred between the server and receiver as an evaluation of how good this is at actually predicting those free point outcomes. Um, and so here I'm just actually looking at the distribution of that um, residual, so the true free points against their estimated. And one thing that's reassuring is that we see that this is basically a histogram around a value of zero, which suggests that at least the data looks to be well calibrated. There doesn't appear to be any bias in a particular way. Um, what we'd like to additionally see is that we really get more precision around that zero, because you can see quite a range in terms of the count difference. So it may be well calibrated, but it still might not be precise enough for our forecasting methods. Um, so this is giving you another kind of tool that you can use, um, one that I think is particularly useful in a setting where you have this kind of multi-level data. These Bayesian models can be a, a good way to handle that, particularly if it's a fairly, maybe a more complex structure. Um, and as you can see, the the syntax within the Gibbs sampling models um, is, is similar in a lot of ways to what we're used to with, with R. It's just a matter of knowing about what um, distributional assumptions you know, are going to be the best for the particular data that you're working with. So I provided some resources here at the end. If the, the Bayesian setting's a bit new, um, you can read more about that. And uh, hopefully this gives you an idea of some application areas where that type of modeling may be more appropriate. Um, okay, so, so we've reached the end. Um, and I'll hang around if there are particular questions that you have. You've had the material and I'd be happy for any, any feedback. And then um, I'll be at the conference as well. So hopefully <laughs> if there are things that um, you'd like to discuss, we'll, we'll hopefully have time for that. So thank you all um, for attending. I hope there was information here that would be useful for your future work and projects. And um, yeah, definitely let me know if there are things that you think would improve or could be added to this material. Um, so um, thank you all for attending. Thanks.